Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Very excited to be here, flanked with with a, uh, our city manager, our council members, Dr. Uh, Bussels, Reverend Ed McDowell, Will Brennan joining today, uh, other council members, Ms. Ms. Herbert, uh, Mr. Taylor, and Mr. Duvall couldn't make it today, but believe me, this is, is a, a group effort as we move forward. As we promised uh, starting this year that we're open here in Columbia, and a large part of that is about being transparent and accountable for what's in our control. And that's also talking to everybody directly about the issues that we're facing, the problems that we have, and how we plan to fix those. We currently have staffing issues in several key departments that, that are in the range of 550 to 600 employees. A lot of those 200 or plus are in our water department. Solid waste is, has been short in thir close to 30 employees, and then obviously our call center. Uh, has been close to 14 and these shortages have have created you know massive backlogs for us um, you know we're still working on our steel plates which we all promised to get rid of cones and steel plates we've gone from 60 to 38 so we're making some um, some real efforts and and improvements in that we're 4,000 customer repairs backlogged at, at the city we were three weeks behind on yard waste collection. And by coming out and talking to everybody about that, we also let everybody realize we have an opportunity for positions to be filled. And, and we've started getting applications because of that. So part of why we want to keep being transparent and talking through everything is to make sure that people understand where we are, how we're addressing it. And I want to commend both the city manager, city council, and the staff are working together to, to look at things from a different angle so that we can improve the customer service for our employees and, and is for our citizens and our employees. Part of that is what we've discovered is, is that there are things that can be fixed by us just addressing the issue and understanding the root cause. Why is that? 17% of our backlog at water and sewer work orders are around landscaping. Landscaping of, of fixing repairs, sod, and, and other things that could easily have been fixed, but our process required those landscapers have additional insurance requirements that prohibited them from building, bidding on small jobs. By eliminating those and making the correct adjustments, it allows us to take advantage of the private sector that's out there that can help us. By contracting with small businesses, and filling the voids that we have, we're able to provide a more efficient and effective business um, solution to these problems. We've talked heavily about getting them more engaged and helping them solve, at the same time allowing us to grow those small businesses and really advance because businesses that grow in a community hire within that community and stay with that in, in community. That's how headquarters are built. So by starting at the base and growing up is what we're pushing hard to do and at the same time serving our community in a much better capacity. Waterline, we're getting close to 1,200 phone calls into our water department through our customer service by sitting down with our customer service reps and understanding the shortages there and how we can address that and, and making a difference so that when we're, we're addressing these, that people's concerns of emergencies are separated from the folks that are looking to work uh, issues with their bill or refinancing any backlog on, on their part through payment. But it's allowing us to address these issues in, in a direct manner and in a timely manner that makes us more effective and efficient. I'm about to turn this over to our city manager uh, Clint Sheely, our head of utilities, to talk more in detail about our plan. But all of this is about trying to make a difference for our community and our staff. And we committed as a council that we're going to do everything we can internally to improve the quality of customer service, investing in our staff through technology, through training and innovation, looking at things from a different angle to, to improve the quality of service that affects everybody in our community. We're gonna to continue to be transparent. We're gonna talk about all the issues that we, 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 we discover, that we find directly with the public so everybody knows what we're doing and how we're doing it so that there's no question 
about our, our commitment to this community. With that, I'll turn it over to the city manager. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Rickman. Well, as I'm looking out today with our media partners here, and we're so appreciative that they are, it's reminding me back to 2015 when we were standing at the canal and the reason that we did that on a very regular basis harkens back to what Mayor Rickman was just explaining and what many of our council members, Reverend McDowell and others, are always telling us to tell our story. And so we're here today, not uh, during a time of a natural, natural disaster, but certainly, uh, hopefully, coming towards the end, we pray in the aftermath of a global pandemic experiencing um, what I really would equate to a crisis mode. Again, never in my time as manager, and I've been doing it for several, several years now, have I experienced the staffing shortages that we're facing? Have I experienced, um, you know, seeing the volume um, that we're experiencing with uh, water leaks and repairs that need to be made? We truly need to get up in front of our customers in this community that we love so much to, to share and put context, not make excuses, but own the shortcomings and put context around the why. And I know from our experiences in the past, and, and I think we're renewing that effort to just get up and talk and have an honest conversation with this community and our customers about the, the experiences that we have and also the solutions um, and, ch and the opportunities that we are going to put before you um, a new operational plan to address these challenges. And so that is really the purpose of today is to outline um, the challenges and provide insight on why they've been, it's been challenging, provide insight on some opportunities and solutions that we're embracing to address these issues. Um, I know as a, as a citizen myself that it's appreciated when you have information and you understand better. Um, you want the solutions, you want to make sure your call is being received, but it, it also um, is a little bit comforting and we um, take that posture to try to ease some of the tension and, and give you answers to your questions and concerns. So again, this is about the operations in the city. So as the mayor indicated, I will um, hand off to Assistant City Manager Clint Sheely. He and I and all of our teams have worked to try to address some operational changes that we hope will give some relief. We've had some successes already so far. Many of our council members have weighed in based on even their previous experiences in business, et cetera, on ways that we can maybe accelerate our hiring processes, and we've done that. Um, we've uh, implemented some creative ways to capture talent, um, try to begin to retain talent, streamline the early process of, of onboarding at the City of Columbia. Um, we're also looking at creating alternative schedules. We know now, since the pandemic in particular, people work differently. And so we're looking at some creative approaches to providing opportunities for great, talented people out there who may be interested in working a 30 hour a week um, schedule. We're looking at that. We're looking at um, retirees. There are many retirees out there who have a lot more to give and uh, we're hoping to bring them on to um, the city of Columbia. And, and finally, as far as the hiring goes, adjusting our pay scales to ensure that our uh, laborers and people just getting started with us have a livable wage, not just a minimum wage, but a livable wage. And so these are all operational um, decisions that we are in the process of making. We've implemented many, and we're um, going to continue to do that, looking at how to improve our service delivery. In addition, Clint will address the high number of work orders, as Mayor Rickman mentioned, in our water distribution system and the efforts we're, we're making um, to hire contract contractors and vendors to help us through indefinite delivery contracts. We want to promote local talent. There are contractors out there who can help complement our efforts with our internal forces, and obviously we need that right now. So we are moving forward to address these critical leaks faster in a more uh, prioritized manner by using those uh, contractors to help sustain our ongoing focus on replacing our aging infrastructure. 
So with that, I will be back up at the end to help answer any specific questions you might have. Um, but I know Clint is going to do a little bit deeper dive with this new customer response action plan that we've established. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, and good morning, everybody. Good, good to see everyone. Um, I think everybody knows the COVID-19 pandemic has created a lot of challenges for, for all of us. And, um, and, and we at the city have, have, have not been immune to that, um, especially in the area of customer service and responsiveness. Um, employee retention, just being shorthanded on staff, um, significant increases in call volume, backlog of service calls and not being able to respond as we want to and as our customers deserve is a real issue for us right now. And, and so we're working through that and have developed this, this action plan to help us. Um, I would say that I'm really proud of how our, our staff has responded to these challenges throughout the pandemic. Um, they've worked very, very hard through some really challenging times to be as responsive as we possibly could be. And, uh, and hopefully we're coming out of some of these challenges and our numbers are looking much better in terms of quarantines and infections within our, at least the Columbia Water staff. So we're, we're really proud of that. But I'd remiss if I didn't, if I didn't uh, give a thanks to our staff for providing those essential services that, that we all need, whether it's uh, garbage collection, drinking water, provision of wastewater services, um, all of those services, police, fire, all those things, and, and really proud of our folks and, and how we've done. We've also done some positive things during the pandemic. We opened a new customer care and payment center on Hardin Street that's made it easier for our customers to walk in and do a transaction. Um, we're, we're nearing completion of our automated metering infrastructure project, which was a significant investment of our ratepayer dollars to improve the way we read our, our water meters and send out accurate water bills. So really proud of that. Ms. Wilson mentioned utilizing private contractors. We've started doing that more to try to supplement our backlog of staff. Um, we realize there's a lot of room to go. We've got a significant gap to close. Um, our customer wait times, when you, when you call to report a, a service leak or, or get on a payment arrangement, they're, they're way too long. And it's not because our staff aren't working hard. We just don't have enough of them to handle the volume of calls that, that we're receiving right now. We know yard, de yard, yard debris pickup has not always been as timely as our customers have, have grown to to uh, expect from us and, and we're, we're addressing that. Um, so again, developing this customer response plan to, to, to try to address those issues. And I wanted to just step through three of the key areas that we're, that we're modifying our operations and how we're doing that. And then we'll try to answer questions that you might have. Over the years we've had, a, um, and for the past 10 years, we've had a city employee answering your calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So if you call at 3 a.m. with an emergency or a question or needing a bill adjustment, we've got city employees working that call center to answer that question. We have traditionally seen um, a much lower volume of calls than we're seeing now. Coming out of the pandemic, um, we have seen over a 40% increase in call volume, and we simply don't have the manpower on the phones to, to address those in a timely manner. That means for a customer, you may be on hold for an extended period of time, particularly during high call traffic um, hours. So we're doing something about that. Uh, another reason for the significant increase in calls is our city council was very compassionate about disconnecting water service for non-payment of water bills for about a year. We didn't disconnect service for non-payment of water bills. We've resumed that. If you disconnect a customer service, that generates a call, generates a discussion about a payment arrangement and, and a payment and getting caught back up. And we're also pushing assistance programs that are out there for our customers. So that's a large increase in the call volume that we're seeing. And so we're, we're trying to be responsive and address that. But no matter how much that volume has increased, we know we've got to reduce that wait time. And our goal is to handle every call in an efficient and timely manner. So we're increasing our staffing levels by repositioning folks from night shift, from weekend shift, onto that day shift where we get the vast majority of our phone calls. So we're repositioning existing staff um, and, and modifying that process. We're also, um, hiring, filling vacancies. We've been very aggressive in the last few months of filling vacancies. So you're going to see several new call takers over the month of March come out of training 
and hit the call center floor. So we'll be back closer to fully staffed. Um, and, and then a, a major modification, a shift in, in how we operate that call center is gonna be happening in the next few weeks. You're gonna see our call center and our city employees working from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we're gonna transition after hours to, to working with the private sector in an answering service. They will, they will triage the calls. If they're bill payment calls and questions, then they can be directed to self-help through our automated system, through pay by phone, um, or can call the next day or a message can be taken. If it's an urgent water or sewer or another urgent issue that needs immediate attention, someone can't shut their water off and they've got a leak in their home, someone's got a sewer backup, things of that nature, those calls will be dispatched to our own call division staff for, and, and they'll be addressed by our field crews that are, that are on call and working the overnight shift. So we won't have city staff taking that first call. We're gonna partner with an answering service, which is what a lot of our neighboring utilities and municipalities do already. So modifying operations, and we think that surge of staffing on the day shift when the vast majority of our calls is, are coming in is gonna to lead to a much quicker response time when, we're, when someone calls, we'll answer the phone quicker and we'll be able to address their problem in a timely manner and get it out to our, to our division staff. There's been much discussion about uh, water leaks and, and what's happening in our water system. Certainly aging infrastructure, as Ms. Wilson mentioned, is a, is a real issue for us. Um, we have a lot of galvanized and unlined cast iron lines that are, that are in the ground that are nearing the end of their useful life. And, and so they leak and we've got to repair those leaks. So we, we've got significant backlog based on staff shortages. And so we're, we're partnering with, um, with contractors through indefinite delivery contract process, expanding and accelerating that work so that we can use the private sector to fill those gaps and be more responsive to fixing those leaks and, and prioritizing that. Um, we're also looking at surging our, our, our staffing and, and trying to fill a lot of the vacancies that we have in, in our field operations of water distribution. So we're gonna, you're gonna see us having open interviews at this facility, much like we did in Public Works. Um, recently, you're gonna see us doing some alternative marketing approaches. Um, you're gonna see us using temporary agencies, temporary labor agencies to onboard employees quicker Get them, get them acclimated into how we do business and trained and, and start helping us with the backlog of work that we've got. Roadway restoration, the mayor mentioned steel plates, big priority for us. Um, we're also um, employing contractors to help us with restoration. After a leak's been repaired, it's backfilled and plated, there needs to be some asphalt patching work. Um, we're, we're, we're engaging private contractors to help us address that backlog as well and are grateful to have that tool in our toolbox to be able to respond. Um, and, and the mayor also mentioned engaging local landscapers. We're gonna modify our insurance requirements, put out a solicitation and, 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 and help local business help us to repair yards where we've, we've fixed service lines. High vacancy rates have been an issue in public works as well. Um, and, and so you remember the, that we were three or so weeks behind collecting yard trash. We had an incredibly heavy leaf season this year. All the leaves fell in a very short period of time and then we had some, some nice weather on weekends where folks were getting out and cleaning up their yards. And so that hits the curb and we've got to pick that up. We saw our yard waste tonnages increase by over fourfold in December and January. So um, of a significant increase in the volume of work coupled with short staffing, that leads to delays in service delivery. So we were very aggressive in, um, in trying to hire those laborer positions, even through a temporary agency. And I'm really delighted to report that we're back on schedule now um, with our normal weekly yard debris collection. So, so that's a real success for us. Um, so that's the high level of the approach. Be glad to answer any questions you have, but I believe the, the mayor had a, a few closing remarks he wanted to share. Thank you. Once again, I just wanted to, to thank everybody for being here, but this is the beginning of the series of us really opening up and talking to, to everyone in our community. And I, I just want to give you some highlights of things to come. Dr. Bustles has been working hard with our staff and moving forward to, to create a better way of, for us to communicate across all lines. If it's boil water advisories to just general communication and how we tell our story that we talked about. 
Reverend McDowell ha has committed to help us deal with the homelessness in the immediate area of our downtown communities. Mr. Brennan has been working hard both with the university and our state government to how we repurpose those properties and, and how we don't take things off the um, property tax anymore and actually work to rebuild and do a, a real joint venture together so we keep property producing property tax but also uh, helping the campus and the state grow at the same time. Mr. Taylor has been helping tremendously working with our HR department on how we market and recruit, how we look at things differently, taking a stab at how we look at marketing our city for economic development and growth. I'd be remiss if, if I didn't talk about Ms. Herbert and her efforts to work together with both our community to build a, a skilled training center. We have a large population of 18 to 24 year olds that, that really could be our, our future workforce and how we get them ready through OSHA training and helping them get apprenticeships and internships to really grow and put them in the marketplace so that they're career ready. This is what this council is committed to. We committed to being open. We committed to collaborations. We committed to new ideas and we committed to to always be transparent and we're going to continue to do that as we move forward. So with that I will we'll open it up for questions. Clint. Council. Um, you know you mentioned that you're going to fix the problem at the call center, the sh staffing shortage, by moving some of the night side workers and the weekend workers to a more the day side look, but aren't you just causing another problem by trying to fix another one because isn't that now creating a shortage in the nightside crew and weekend crew as well? And it's a great question. And if we look at, and we've done some data analysis of our call volume and frequency, when are the calls coming in? And so we're averaging about nine calls um, from about 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning, nine calls per, uh, per day. And so the vast majority of those 12 to 1,500 calls are happening during those normal business hours of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so we want to apply our resources and staffing to when those calls are coming in. A large majority of those calls are payment arrangement calls. Um, so we're getting very few calls on the night shift, the overnight hours. And um, so we feel like an answering service model works well because of those eight or nine that are coming in. Most of those are more emergency, urgent type calls. So Folks, call uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it'll be a call service. It's, it's a call service, a third party answering service. They're going to answer the phone for us and then direct, if it is an emergency, it's going to be directed to our divisional staff that are addressing those emergencies anyway. So we think it's a better model to, to, to apply our staffing load where the volume and frequency of calls are occurring. So I'll speak for Columbia Water and, um, and, and within the Columbia Water Organization, our field operations are, are um, we're receiving the, the most shortage there. Um, we do require a commercial driver's license in a lot of our areas and certainly that affects public works as well. And a commercial driver's license is a very popular commodity right now. And so, um, you know, retaining those, we, we, we hire folks in, we train them to get that commercial driver's license and then um, they're significant. Uh, increases in pay that can be made to be an over-the-road trucker, uh, particularly right now. So those are some of the pain points that we're seeing in our in our field labor positions and um, and, and in our commercial driver's license spots. I don't know if there are other areas we want to speak to, Ms. Wilson. Now, another that would come to mind is 911 communications. Um, as you can imagine, that is a high-stress job. Um, you know, a lot of anxiety with folks calling in for whatever this, their situation might be. And so historically, there's been turnover in that area because you get people in, they train, you know, and if they're cut out for it, they stay and they're great. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. But combined with the market and the uh, ability for folks to, I guess, seek other types of employment, we have seen some a lot of continued turnover there. We have increased the starting salary there. Um, in an effort to help bridge that gap, and I think that's paying dividends for us so far as well. Have y'all, sorry, I have a question. Have y'all um, proposed a new budget or you know anything like that, a new monetary figure to make all these changes, and how optimistic are you about 
about getting those vacancies filled even by the end of this year? So, so we are in budget season, um, and, and our, our proposed budget does contemplate this, but um, I, what we found, particularly in surging the, the, the call center and, and, and employing that third-party answering service, it's a very economical approach, and we've, got, we've had some fairly significant vacancies that we're now filling, but, but we're able to use that vacancy money from this fiscal year to fill the remainder of the fiscal year and pay for the call center, and, and then we're budgeting accordingly moving forward. But very small financial impact because we simply don't receive that many calls in those overnight periods, and you pay per service by, by the call and the minutes that you, that you utilize. So um, that answers maybe one of your questions. Um, I, I think budgeting, you also mentioned. Um, oh, my second part was um, how optimistic are you that uh, those vacancies will be filled even before the year is over? So, um, of course, we won't be filling all of those vacancies, but we're looking to evaluate every open position and make sure the criteria for filling that position is absolutely necessary. Does that employee have to have a commercial driver's license or not, or can we, can we downsize some equipment and use mini excavators to repair service line leaks? That's part of our plan as well. And as, as we look to budget our capital plan moving forward, you'll see an increased focus on replacing two-inch galvanized lines that are in, in neighborhoods and cul-de-sacs that continue to leak and, and we go and repair in the next three, four weeks, they're leaking again. The answer is replacing that infrastructure. So you'll see a renewed emphasis on replacing aging infrastructure in our budget requests. What is the biggest factor of getting people in for the, all these jobs? The, the big, for, what is the biggest factor for people not jumping in? So um, I think awareness is a part of it um, and, and making sure that we're getting our message out, we're telling our story that we do have the openings there. Um, pay, Ms. Wilson has mentioned evaluating, you know, our pay scales and making sure that we're paying appropriately and, um, you know, educating them about the, about the work that, that we are doing. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Wilson. You know, it's competitive out there right now. As much as we are facing um, these shortages in staff, others are too. So that, that key period of time from when someone comes in may have an interest in a position, but they may have also be testing the waters other places as well. But we've tried to really do, particularly with some of these positions we've been describing to you today, is streamline our onboarding process to make that process a lot quicker, more efficient for us to make that offer and, and grab these talented individuals that are out there. They still have to go through the process. We still have to make sure, you know, background checks and all those things are done but we've come up with a way to bridge the gap and work with a temporary agency to help us um, get through some of the processes, the paperwork, the time, reduce that time significantly, really 30 to 45 days where we're making quick offers, getting people in, evaluating them quickly, because we know that they are also um, out there exploring their options with other agencies and, and jobs as well. So I think that's been a big part of it. Well, that part of it, I would say, is from my experience today doing just this, using you all, our media partners, to help get the word out as to why and the context of why some of this has been occurring and that we are solutions driven right now to, to correct um, any shortcomings. But sometimes people just don't understand the volume we've experienced. They don't understand the vacancies we've had. We haven't told that story, and I think that's a big part of it. I, again, I. I think back to the time after the flood. People were just looking for information. It was a comfort to them for us to stand up out there at the canal as hard as it was to do it. Um, because then, I mean, just so many things were on the line. But now, too, people are experiencing a lot of anxiety since the pandemic. They are um, needing to have answers from, our, from us as public servants, and I think that's what I would say. We're up here to tell, to give them the answers and to be honest. 
I, I just want to add to that by, by looking at things differently and understanding where our choke points are. You know, when you take those 4,000 work orders and you break it down and you look at it, well, 17% is landscaping, but our own process has, has systematically kept us from using these third parties and we fix that. That allows us to address that. That means people are getting responses immediately to get those fixed. Then you look at, there's 660 water meters that need to be set third party let's you know unit price we know what it's cost we put that out to a third party let our team do what we do best at the city which is deal with the major problems our crews are fantastic with that it's it's all these other little ancillaries and by addressing them and breaking them down and looking at exactly what's caused us to have hurdles to get that done and as, as we mentioned earlier about the insurance requirements but also now that we have we have more women and minority owned uh, construction businesses in our community, utilizing them to take care of the repairs afterwards, fixing the potholes. We're talking about being able to turn around things in 24 to 48 hours where it's taking us weeks. Your question earlier about rehiring, there's not a possible way that we could hire 220 people to fill all these jobs. But at this point, why would we, we do that when we have an opportunity to grow a small business take care of the customer's needs first and grow a business that's gonna hire and stay here. So it's a win-win for everybody. So as we continue to, to take these opportunities, we're gonna address them that way. Does that have an effect on uh, customer sales? No. No, what, what you're seeing now is us being able to work with our existing budget. And as we move forward and we start to, to build a budget from the bottom up, We'll be able to account for all this, but it just opens up more opportunities and makes it more efficient and using the same amount of money. So it's a win-win all the way across. Mayor Rickman, yes, or, sir. Uh, Mr. Shealy, I have a question. So, you know, as you just mentioned right now, there's 220 jobs, but, you know, two weeks ago when we spoke, I was told that there was 207. Have you guys seen more people leave Columbia Water then, um, since you're saying there's 220 now? It's 209. 209, to be correct. And then um, to talk, kind of talk about, you know. So you can give me 14 credits, please. <laughs> 209. Um, all right, and then to City Manager Wilson, you know, you mentioned you want to use the media to essentially, you know, get the word out, show transparency about, you know, getting these job openings um, out there. You know, obviously, you know, I, I did a story with you guys two weeks ago, and we mentioned that we have this many job openings, and you guys are raising um, the pay or competitive pay, and, doing more opportunities to kind of speed up the process to get yeah. more people hired. Have you seen any changes within the past two weeks since I did that story with you guys? Yeah, so I will give you some credit for helping us um, to get the word out. Like I said, I think that it's very important because we know that our community is, um, you know, media driven, social media, um, billboards, radio, print. Um, our HR director is back there probably beaming because she's so excited to be able to, you know, utilize some of these mechanisms. Um, we have new members of council. I know Dr. Bustles, you know, she's always, as Mr. Rickman said, promoting new ways to communicate here at the City of Columbia. So absolutely, in the last two weeks, from the public uh, work standpoint, which is where we kind of started because of that heavy lift, literally, that we needed um, as far as the solid waste pickup, the yard debris, um, uh, Robert Anderson. And, you know, and let me say, we historically have been with the city many years. When we've done customer surveys, our solid waste and yard debris pickup, that staff has always gotten the highest ratings. So truly, this has been a big deal for us too because We've never experienced this before where, you know, our, our citizens have had complaints about these delays. We've never been in a posture like that with that particular service. It's always been the most glowing of, um, of, of feedback from our community. So that really, we take it to heart. I know Robert's back there, our public works director, and it's been, he's been with the city. How many years, Robert? 34. 34 years. And um, we just hadn't experienced this before. And so getting that story out there and then also utilizing whatever platforms to include the media to, to let people know who want to come work for the city. It's a great city. We have great benefits. We have great opportunities, opportunities for advancement. 
Um, telling that over the last two weeks, yes, I think it's made a, a huge difference. And you're going to begin to see commercials and billboards and all other types of, um, of opportunities um, that we can put um, to use to, to continue to try to get the best talent but retain that talent. And I mentioned a livable wage. We understand that we have to be competitive and we've got to keep those folks if we're, if we're fortunate enough to get them. Uh, now, Ms. Wilson, since you're already up here, um, you know, as you mentioned, you want to be transparent with the community and build that connection again with them after all the problems that have been reported within the past, um, past year, I'll say. Um, but, you know, apart from advertising and kind of helping bring in more people to apply with you guys, you know, a lot of community members that I did speak with two weeks ago and even a couple of days ago, um, not even just in one particular area, but we'll say Forest Acres in Columbia, um, and as well as St. Andrews, as well across the river, they've all said that they kind of lost trust and hope that you guys are actually going to do, you know, what they need for the better of themselves and their family. So how can they ensure, or what are you guys doing to rebuild that trust that, you know, they can trust the water, that it's safe for them to drink, that it's not going to be brown anymore, or just things like that? Sure. Well, we're gonna we're gonna be accountable you know we have um, federal mandates um, that apply to water and um, sewer issues that we've been facing as any community would um, the our community can rest assured um, because I'm not one to be alarming that our water is safe to drink it tastes good um, and if as Director, Assistant City Manager Sheely mentioned, there are any issues of brown water ever. Um, it's because of those pipes, that aging infrastructure, but we still would never allow uh, any citizen to be put in harm's way. So even with that said, if they see brown water, we, we will continue to put out um, the notifications. I know Dr. Bussels um, has been working with our staff about full water advisories and and how quickly we get those out on different platforms, um, different applications and, and calls that even our residents can receive. So I would just say, um, I hope that the, the community trusts us. I mean, we don't get up here nor take lightly um, the, the jobs that, that we have before us as public servants. So I would just simply stand here and you know, the staff all reports to me if they have a question or a concern. You know, my mobile number is 803-413-3118. Call me anytime. You know, I, I work pretty much 24-7, you know, like our public safety staff do. I get the calls all through the night. Um, I, I certainly don't take it lightly, and I understand your question, but we would implore upon them to trust us, and we wouldn't be standing up here if we didn't mean what we say. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, a few areas um, where we've had problems, and as we as we map our where our leaks are occurring, where discolored water complaints are, are occurring, Forest Acres, Irmo, St. Andrews, Friarsgate area, some in the Eau Claire area, um, that we have continuing leaks there, continuing discolored water complaints. Those are a byproduct of the city inheriting infrastructure um, we didn't put that in but we did inherit that infrastructure over time over generational um, transactions and and now that infrastructure needs to be replaced so where, where customers are being served from a two inch galvanized line um, they may occasionally get some discolored water if we're if we're not flushing as we need to if that water's not turning over um, they they're going to see an increase in water leaks what you're going to see in our capital improvement program on the water side, an increased focus on replacing that infrastructure because that's the long-term answer to doing that. We can't do it all in one year. Uh, the, the, the price tag is daunting, but um, being systematic on how we manage those assets and how we replace those assets is very, very important. We've been strategic and have addressed some of the older areas of town, Earlwood, Booker Washington Heights, um, we've got projects in Rosewood and Shandon forthcoming that are under design now to address those types of issues. And then we move on to the next level where we see a high frequency of leaks and, and discolored water complaints. So it's a process. We do, we understand that, that customer confidence is, is key in this business. 
we're happy to come sample anybody's water, no charge to them at any time, and, and our certified laboratory can run those analysis. So, so that's a service that we offer. And um, I think also in terms of combating frustration, if they can get through to the call center, speak to a human being in, a, in an appropriate time and get those calls dispatched and then those leaks are fixed more quickly, that's the interim measure that we need to take until we can solve that overarching problem. that you guys are finding pipes that are 80 plus years old. There was one pipe that you told me that you found was to be nearly 100 years old. Um, and with these aging infrastructures, are you guys actually working on fixing the pipes today as we talk, are there crews out? Or are you just waiting for the pipes to burst, people report, and then that's when you replace them in? So we're actively replacing infrastructure that, that for projects that have been designed and bid for construction and, and our crews are doing some um, limited replacement as well. Um, most of what our staffing is doing today is fixing those active leaks because we do have a pretty pretty heavy work, work order backlog. Um, looking ahead, it's planning on when's that next replacement need to happen and what areas and communities do we need to focus on. So we're doing a combination of both. Um, any preventive maintenance and, and replacement that we can do, we're doing. As we look at our and we study and analyze the age of the infrastructure and the frequency of leaks and discolored water complaints, that informs us where to go next to make those improvements. Is there any actions that you would request from the community to help you um, be more diligent in uh, helping to fill those vacancies? Yeah, so um, I think in the immediate interim, using the online chat feature that we've got is a way to catalog that or email that complaint if you can't get through to the call center very quickly we'll have these modifications in place where they'll be able to call and make that notification but but the sooner we know about an issue the sooner we can get out and correct it and also i mentioned we're, we're logging that data and using that information to inform us on where to move for the next capital improvements so um, if folks are having problems and, and we're not aware of it, then that's a real problem. We need to know what's going on and we want that open communication. We also have the My Columbia SC app that folks can use, uh, download through either the, the Apple or, um, or Android store and, um, and, and can use that to report leaks and generate service orders as well. Um, your call center, when can residents expect these changes to happen, you know, the night size and so that transition is scheduled to happen on or before March 21st. So within about a month, um, March 4th, we've got four more call takers that are city employees now, but they're going through training. The last thing we want to do is put somebody answering the phones that is not equipped with the tools they need to help the customers. Let's let Tiffany Latimer, our customer care administrator, answer that in more detail. Thank you. Welcome. So yes, absolutely. We plan to um, go ahead and hire an answering service to answer our emergency only calls during our evening, our weekends, and our holidays. Um, as as uh, Mr. Sheely uh, mentioned earlier, the reason for doing that and what it will allow us to do is to bring our second and third shift folks onto the first shift where we see and we know we have most of our, our calls coming in. Um, just to kind of tell a story, as, as Ms. Wilson said, what we're, we're up here to do is pre-pandemic, um, our call volume was around 13,000 calls a month. Where now we're seeing where our call volume has increased so much where it's more like 25,000 a month that we're seeing. So um, this will help us right now to be able to transition those staff that are already fully trained from our second and our third shift, bring them on to our first shift to be able to answer our co customers' calls more quickly and be more responsive. So we do plan to implement this um, rather quickly and have this in place um, before April. Now, why do you believe that there was that increase pre-pandemic versus now? Well, as Mr. Sheely said, um, we did not disconnect um, customers' accounts for over a year due to the pandemic. Um, and now we have slowly tried to transition back to um, that process. And so therefore we have received uh, numerous amounts of calls. Um, and, and of course, um, with staffing shortages, the, the high volume of calls, but not being able to manage that with the, the short staff that we have. So that's why the hiring efforts that we discussed earlier are so important and vital right now. But a lot of that is due to, as I said, us not disconnecting um, past due accounts for customers for, for over a year because of the pandemic. 
absolutely. Um, one other um, change that we just made actually last week um, is to prioritize our emergency type calls. So prior to last week, all the calls that came into our, our queue were all just you know come in as, as they come and they were answered as they, they came in. What we've done now is we've prioritized our calls. So if there's a water leak um, or a sewer emergency, those calls come into our queue first. So those calls will be answered before the other calls such as you know general payment information, uh, payment arrangement type calls. So that's a, a really good thing that we've done just to kind of help um, answer more quickly those priority type emergency calls.